Lucky first, and we have four candidates ready and willing to serve. They will have the opportunity to directly hear from each candidate on several important issues. Let me explain the, the format. Uh, each candidate will have one minute to give an opening statement. Uh, many of the candidates have statements on the tables around the room. We have those to read as well. Each candidate, uh, oh, we welcome them. After the opening statements, I, as moderator, will begin with questions. Uh, eight questions brought to you by the Civic League Board. I will go through first. And each candidate will have one minute to respond. And we'll rotate the candidate answering the first question on down the line. I think we're ready to go. So, we'll begin with Phil. If you're ready, we're ready. You got a light. Testing. There you go. Thanks for coming today. I'm not a politician, and in fact, I've never wanted to seek office before. However, it's apparent that our town is facing mounting struggles with fiscal management, transparency, and personnel management, and a long and troubling list of police department issues. So I felt compelled to act. You now have four candidates for only three commissioner positions. So this is truly a vote for the status quo or one for real change. Real change is not only possible, it's essential to the long-term viability of our town. We have three inexperienced folks running a multifaceted town of government. While they may have some admirable skills, not one of them has run an organization of any size, and it's beginning to show. On the other hand, I've managed significant organizations, including budgets to $48 million, 845 employees, as well as comp plans, payroll, performance reviews, medical plans, and retirement plans. In doing this, I've won multiple awards from the time of coast to coast. You're being asked to select the management of your town. Please choose wisely for all of us. Yeah, I'm, I'm a loud mouth. You'll hear me no matter what. Uh, I'm a 20 year property owner, full time resident, and father of two sons and five grandchildren that probably hate to see me come up here and stand up and talk like this anyway. Uh, I worked for the CIA at the White House, stationed at the White House. I then went into the Marine Corps, was a sergeant in the Marine Corps in Vietnam and Cuba, and went to Okinawa for. Uh, uh, NCO leadership school. I was with the Boy Scouts of Greater Washington, uh, Northern Virginia, Washington, D.C., and Maryland at a number of different facilities. I was a branch manager and program manager there and ran their summer, excuse me, summer residence camp. Um, I have worked for the U.S. Post Office for a number of years and retired there. I also went to the, as, as a union leader, I went to uh, the AFL-CIO, uh, APW, American Postal Workers Union Leadership School. I went to the Management Academy for the U.S. Postal Service. Almost every job I've had, I've ended up in a management type position. Thank you. Thank you. Find out. Um, my name is John E. Redder for the third, but most of you know me as TJ. I was born in Dewey Beach back in 1961. I met my wife at the waterfront in 1987, 32 years ago, hard to believe. Uh, we live on the second block of Houston Street, and I'm the owner and broker of Rehoboth Bay Realty, located right across the street from my home in the Rehoboth by the Sea office building. Full disclosure for those that don't know me, my family's been part of Dewey Beach history since 1925. And so for anyone in the room today that has roots as deep as mine, we're probably related. <laughs> um, more of a pretty place. As lifelong members of the community, volunteering has always been part of my life too, and it's part of what makes Dewey Beach great. We couldn't run this town without its volunteers. I have served in volunteer leadership roles for over 20 years, and for me, volunteering, attending public meetings, and protecting property values has been part of my core for as long as I can remember. It's with great pride that I have served our town as mayor for the last two years, and in my Mayor's Corner newsletter, I go, above and beyond to communicate a positive message for our town that has never been done before. And today I'm here to ask you once more for your vote. Thank you.
You want to try? I'll try. He's Paul. All right. My name is Paul Bauer. I've been a commissioner here for uh, the last two years. Uh, you know, it's, we started thinking about this where we were two years ago and where we are today. Uh, you know, as an incumbent, that's what you're measured against. So, you know, a couple years ago we were in a, in a pretty tough spot. Uh, I don't think anybody was very happy with how the town was being run, which is you know, compelled TJ and I to run two years ago. Uh, and I think we've made some great progress. Uh, you know, we've left flyers on your table so you can see and judge for yourself. Um, you know the tangible things that, that are being done in town uh you know there's a pedestrian sidewalk uh, project that's starting next month uh repaving of highway one there's a lot of stuff we've done working with the state and if we don't have those relationships it's tough to get participation uh, and navigate through through the nice folks up in dover so uh you know as we we went through these two years i learned a lot uh you know i volunteered for a lot of committees in the past and been active and i don't know i can't even count how many events i've been in <laughs> this town. But, uh, you know, as we sit here two years ago, or two, two years from now, uh, hopefully we, we can have a different discussion of how much better we've gotten. Okay. Well, that helped. <laughs> We're going to start with Dan on our first question. Uh, statistically, most of our crime related numbers are down. Yet, we have experienced significant incidents that give us pause. Do you consider Dewey Beach a safe place to live and vacation? What changes do you think would have the greatest effect? Would you repeat the question? Okay. Turn on I think that's a little bit. Go back. go back to statistically. Most of our crime related numbers are down, yet we have experienced significant incidents that give us pause. Do you consider Dewey Beach a safe place to live and vacation? What changes do you think would have the greatest effect? Well, if any of you out there have been here as long as I've been in Dewey, I, if you've been here as long as I've been in Dewey, you know that it is a lot better in Dewey now than it was in the past. Dewey was a pretty rowdy town when I first got here. One of the reasons probably why I came here. And, uh, uh, and because I have a family, I'm more concerned about it being a family town. And little by little, we have, you'll see on the town, on the streets now, people pushing baby carriages. Fathers who met their wives here pushing baby carriages. They break, they're going to raise their family coming to do with me, and that's important. We've had one, excuse me, two bad problems with one business this year, and the police, the town mayor, and the town manager in particular solved that with the help of a business owner, and that has now gotten a lot better. I'm Okay. Um, I don't think I need it either, but we'll hold it to make it look good. Um, the, um, the question I think asks, do I believe that it's, is this a safe place to live and vacation and all of that? And I believe wholeheartedly that this is a great town to raise a family, to go on vacation and be part of a community. Yes, we did have some incidents this June uh, that were disturbing and uh, we went out of our way immediately, tirelessly to correct those issues. Um, it is going to be an ongoing situation that we must do a better job at moving forward. And I plan to continue in that work to, to improve those areas of concern within our town. Um, I, can we do more? Can we communicate better? Without question. Um, and I, I can't thank enough all the people that came together in early June. You're a big part of that. And you're a big part of that too. And so is Scott Conant, our town manager. So. Uh, thanks to everyone that helped participate and keep our town as safe and clean as it's been this summer. Um, I look forward to doing even more in the year to come. Yeah, public safety is, is something that everybody's concerned about. I mean, it's, you know, it's, the, the incidents, that if you look historically, they always happen back in June. Um, and one of the reasons is that parking lot that's back there. And part of the fix of that is you have to light it up. And when it's not dark, people tend to do things that uh, they don't like to do things in the daylight. Uh, can you control who comes in and out of this town? Not really. Uh, you know, this is a destination, you know, what can we do? Once they're here, we have to police it. Uh, so we've hired a consultant who's given us some great ideas on how we can do a, a better job policing and we're improving in those areas. Uh, and staffing and, and things along those lines. But we have to continue to do that. Now we don't need a, a, a ton of full-time police officers, but occasionally we need some part-time police officers. So we have to make it desirable for someone to want to sign up and, and just do an extra pay job. 
Uh, there was some expense that we ran into uh, by doing it, but what's the choice? Would you rather be safer and worry about the money later, or do you want to worry about the money now and, and have the problems persist? So we, we chose to fix it immediately. Thank you. Going down the road. Hey, what is So I've always thought Dewey Beach was a safe town. Uh, that's because most of the people who come here come here to have a good time and have a vacation or they live down here, or they come down here periodically because they own property. Uh, the, the choice was to spend money now and worry about it later, or I don't know what, but the, the real choice was to spend the money up front to staff the police department properly. Without proper police staffing, you're going to have problems, they're going to reoccur, and it wasn't taken care of ahead of time. It was dealt with as an emergency for $6,000 a weekend after the fact. Thank you. All right, the next question will come to you, TJ. Yes. Do you support increases in occupancy taxes, hotel and short-term rentals? Do the proposed changes at the county and state levels have any bearing on your position? Don't hit the button yet. <laughs> um, the accommodations tax, uh, occupancy tax. It's an important part of the lifeblood of Dewey Beach. And for those people in this room today that are landlords that rent their properties, thank you for the efforts that you make to make sure that that 3% gets back to our town. I think the question asks about the, uh, the impact of what has recently happened in our county. The county has agreed to now add a 3% tax on top of the hotels that are out there. What is interesting about that tax is it's going to benefit coastal communities. Um, so, because part of that money must go towards tourism, feature punishment, and many other things. As a town, we belong to a, an organization of seven coastal towns. It's called ACT, um, the Association of Coastal Towns. And in that lobbying group, we're pushing hard at a county level to make sure that that money stays in the coastal area wherever possible. And that was the promise the county made. Now, part of, the other part of the question is, do I think that we need, I think you're asking, do we need to increase that sum? Do you need to increase that and uh, uh, the effect of also I I lost of hotels? The, well, I, I'll give a real quick answer to that. We're going to need the hotels to help us in this effort to fund the things we need. There's also a question that I think even Commissioner Moskowitz has talked about this before too, about seeing about the Royal Sarfer timeshare property in town that currently pays 8% to Dover. But it is their individual owners that own that property, and perhaps there's a way we can find a way to get that three percent to come back to town. Sorry, I keep talking. I know the rules. Uh, so <laughs> that happens for everybody that's not aware. So currently, a, ho a hotel charges eight uh, percent. They get charged eight percent tax, and, and the state collects that. One percent goes towards the beach replenishment. That's what funds what we're getting in a, another month, and one percent goes towards the. Uh, promoting tourism, and then 6% goes to the state. Zero of that comes to Dewey. You know, indirectly, we get 1% for beach replenishment, so you know, it's not like we're not getting anything, but that's every hotel in the state. So when someone's coming here to rent a house or go to a hotel, the choice is this one's already up 8%, and this is over at three. So I hear both sides of the argument, and that's a, it's a debate that I think we're, you know, we're gonna need to address. Uh, you know, they, they, there are some expensive things that are coming down the pipe that we have to afford, and we have to figure out how to pay for it. So maybe there's a, you know, some of the properties, or, you know, is that a hotel, or is that somebody renting their house, like a surf club, for example, and how should they be renting? And answering this question to a person that owns a hotel is really a joy. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that hard. It's not that hard. Do you, do, you, do you support increases in occupancy taxes with hotel and short-term rentals included? Do you the proposed changes at the county and state levels have any bearing on your decision? Uh, well, I I don't think that increases in taxes are the answer to anything until someone has done a thorough review and planned out an actual budget that makes sense. Last I heard, the budget is done by dividing all the revenue between 12 months. Well, <laughs> if anybody thinks that's the way you do a budget, they're in the wrong job because a budget is supposed to be a monthly uh, 
map of your finances, your income and your outgoing. And so if you're uh, just dividing the number by 12 and putting it in a box, I mean, you're not learning anything, you're not doing anything, you're not managing anything, you're not gonna succeed. So increases in taxes are definitely not something I'm in favor of unless it's the absolute last thing that can happen. And I don't care what the tax is. Thank you. I'll send that over to Dale. Uh, you. The short-term rentals, the people that own houses in this town and rent their property have to make sure they add 3% for the people who rent from them to pay to the town. The hotels do not at this time, and I don't think that's right. I think the hotels need to step up to the plate since the county and the state have changed their, their tax rate and um, and have put the other hotels, for instance, like in the Hobbit and on the Forgotten Mile, those hotels are going to have 3% added. There is no longer the, the claim by the hotels that they would be at a disadvantage. I would be for putting the 3% accommodation tax on the hotel room as long as it was geared towards infrastructure. I think people are willing to pay if they know where their money is being spent. Dale and I are going to have to talk later. <laughs> oh. Next question for you. With a number of vacant commercial rental commercial locations in town and our financial dependence on business licenses, how would you help our town build a more vibrant business climate? Well, yeah, I mean, you see that, and that's the last thing any town wants to have vacant buildings. Part of our zoning that we've done over the years, we've, we've taken individual events. And if you look at our conditional use, the book is about this thick. And for, you know, when you look at that and you say, well, how come everybody has a different set of rules? And I think, you know, I'm in favor of everybody having the same set of rules. So if you, you're, you're allowed to do this at this establishment, why can't you do it at that establishment? So we've almost picked and choose winners and losers over the years. And, and I think by giving everybody the same set of rules, it would be, A, easier to enforce because if someone wants to enforce something, they have to go get the book and look up that business and say, by the way, you're not allowed to do that. Uh, you know, one of the discussions that recently came up at our, our meetings is what time do the eateries close? Uh, some folks think that should, they should close at 11 o'clock or 1 o'clock sharp. Unfortunately, many of those businesses, anywhere from 50% on up of their business comes in after 1 o'clock. So any, any business that you, you cut their revenue in half, they're not gonna survive. So the mayor is an ambassador of your town and it's an active role, it should be an active role. You can, as mayor, go to other towns, see what businesses are there in a community like ours and try to recruit those places to open up a similar business here. Uh, I, would, I would do outreach to the business community to make sure that they knew what the opportunity was here and work with them to find ways to bring them to do it. Okay. All right, you can keep it here. So, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Finally, would, I'd like you to reread the question. Okay. With a number of vacant commercial locations in town, and our financial dependence on business licenses, how would you help our town build a more vibrant business climate? I, I agree with the, the two at the end of the table here. I, I think number one, you have to have the same rules and regulations uh, as far as um, as far as their license rules go, the conditions on their license, because they all feel that they're being treated fairly. Secondly, I think you have to go to the, the the horse's mouth. I think you have to go to the business and the doing business partnership and the chamber of commerce and say, what are we doing wrong? What can we help with? How can we help you help us? And I think you can solve it that way. Just standing around saying, oh my God, the sky is falling, it's not gonna help us. Is that what's happening now? I'm up. Yes. Okay. I think the question asks, how do we help build a vibrant business community? And part of that is the beginning of that question is understanding our dependence on business license. I believe, and I'm, I don't have the numbers at my fingertips, I think we make something in the neighborhood of about a half a million dollars from business licenses from our community. And there are several different locations throughout town that are vacant. 
Some of this is done, and as much as I respect the idea of going around to different towns to make sure we know what businesses could be here, but some of this we've done to ourselves as a town. There's one business in the south end of town, well, it's not a business, it's a vacant building mm -hmm. that was commercial, then we zoned it residential, and now the owner of that property can't do much of anything with it. And we need to find ways to make sure that that property owner doesn't have a vacant building. And we can't zone things, we can't use zoning that would hurt those people. Um, we also have rules about how, what size business and how, what the parking requirements are. We need to look at all of the pieces and make sure we have a comprehensive idea on how, what we need to do to promote what we need. And, okay. and, and yeah, thank you. Well, the next question I think will come. No, no. Wait, where I, I went first last time. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm Sorry. not trying to mess you. Yeah, thanks for the correction. I'll take it, but <laughs> so Phil's on deck. <laughs> <laughs> the present beach tax we all pay has been limited to the ocean front, the proceeds of the beach tax. Do you think this should stay as is or be used and or increased to assist with the infrastructure needs on the bayside beaches and shoreline as well? No, I don't. I think that the uh, beach tax should be used for the ocean side of the community and Revenue should be raised through a similar type of fee for the Bayside. I'm concerned about these storms and if that money was tapped for anything other than its current purpose, I would want to tap it to do infrastructure so we preemptively have a better way of defending against large storms than we have today. So I would put some of it into infrastructure on the beach side, but if, if the Bayside has an issue, which it obviously does, I would look to generate revenue for that as a separate issue, because I think once you open that, crack that egg open, it's gonna go everywhere. So, and I'm absolutely opposed to that beach money being used for operating expenses when we don't have anybody actually doing that. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, you have to remember that that tax was done by referendum. And there's a lot about that tax that cannot be changed unless we go to referendum again. Now, I'm all for, just like Mr. Rose said, the way he didn't say he wanted to create a new tax, but that's what he said. I'm all for having a, a, an increase in the beach tax as long as it's gonna cover infrastructure for the Bayside. If that has to be done, then we have to go to referendum and get you people to say you're willing to do that. And we would have to explain why that was necessary. And I think we could explain it properly. If not, and you said no, then it wouldn't be done. Can you read the question one more time just so I got it? The present beach tax we all pay has been limited to the ocean front. Do you think this should stay as is or be used and or increased to assist with the infrastructure needs on the Bayside beaches and shoreline as well? Um, I, first off, I agree with Dale, um, that, but there's a, a nuance to this. In the beach tax that we have, the commissioners can increase it by 20% by themselves without a referendum. 20% relates to something like 20 bucks for about 1,100 people in our town and less for others. Um, so we, we could do it on our own and begin to start saving for infrastructure immediately. But I also want to thank those that came before us to make sure that everyone here understands. In the Co Association of Coastal Towns we belong to, only one town saves for the future punishment, and that's Dewey Beach. And we are looked at very oddly at these meetings as the one town that is smart enough to have already started saving for the day when the federal government and the state government says we can no longer help you replenish your beaches. We're not, we don't have enough saved yet to do our beach on our own but we have a lot of money in that account for the, the day it comes that we have to match those funds. So I agree with Dale, and it's important to understand all the parts of our beach tax so that you really get this answer right. And Ella Gates is in the back here. Anna can speak to this uh, in detail, but when this referendum, referendum was done, was it 22 years ago? I might be off a year. Yeah. Um, it was a beach tax, and 22 years ago, we didn't have a bay beach like we have now. Uh, sure. Now, you know, now how are we going to maintain this new beach that was just poured in the past few months over there next to the, to the Hyatt? So that needs to be maintained as well. So we need to talk about it. Uh, 
I'm not sure if we're, we're legally allowed to use anything on the on the bank, and, and that's a you know that's a legal question. That's not a commissioner question. Uh, if you can, I mean, we need to maintain all the beaches in town. Uh, Dewey is, you know, it's, it slopes down towards the bay. I'm a Bayside resident myself, so this is near and dear to my heart. Uh, we need to, uh, you know, we need to do the same things on the beach or on the bay as we do on the ocean. Thank you. Let's try to go on to Dale. To be all right. <clears throat> What are your key goals for the future of Dewey Beach, both short term and long term? That's a usual yeah, question. Yeah, Should have expected yeah, yeah, I've been through this a few times. I, I just really believe that short term we need to handle the budget properly. I don't believe we're doing that now. And I take part of the blame for that because I've been right. I don't think we're following through on our restricted set aside. I don't think we know exactly where all the funds are. I think we could, I think the commissioners are too quick to spend money when they don't really know the, the consequences of that, of that expenditure. I think when we, um, first of the other day, I had voted against initially changing the, the police salary. You know, we, we went from uh, 2.1 uh, to 4% in the budget committee and I asked why and nobody had an answer and we and so I talked against it but then the other day not too long ago in this last month <coughs> we, we raised the police salary because we had facts and figures in front of us and that's the only way we should be doing with our budget now we should have all the facts all the figures thanks Jim thank you sorry about that um, Short-term and long-term goals for the town of Dewey Beach. Is that the question? Yes. Just so I understand. Uh, um, resiliency. They talk about resiliency all the time when it comes to stormwater management, being prepared for a rainy day, being prepared for a big storm, and being prepared for a hurricane like we see in the south, which could come close to us. But I think resiliency is something we need to, could be a short-term goal for stormwater issues, it could also be a short-term goal for our financial issues too. Making sure, like Dale just mentioned, that we are doing the right things and build a resilient town, not only for stormwater issues, but for financial issues. And that can be done immediately, and it needs to be part of our long-term goals as well. Resiliency in finance and with our stormwater issues also come down to individual responsibility for everybody in this room too. Knowing how your stormwater rolls off your house and affects your neighbor. It's important. Knowing how we spend our money and being part of our meetings is important. So uh, the, the play Hamilton has a song in it called Being in the Room Where It Happens. And all of you today are in the room where things happen, and I thank you for that. And we all need to be in the room where things happen and build a better town. Thank you. Wow, right on. You know what, my wife and I would always talk to the kids when they wanted something. We had to define whether it was a need or a want. So we have a lot of wants in town, and we also have a lot of needs. Um, some of my goals for, for the wants, you know, I'll, I'll go on the want side of it. Uh, two, you know, a year and a half ago, we put on those dune mats uh, on, on each street. I think we couldn't do it on one or two of them uh, for different reasons. But uh, now that we're going to have a, a new beach replenishment, uh, I think it would be nice if we can extend those out for, for everybody. So that, that's one of my goals is to do that. Now, last time we did that, we didn't do it, you know, we did it with some leftover budget from the previous year, but that was a, uh, of course, our, uh, Senator Lopez Act. Uh, Senator Lopez was instrumental in helping us uh, get some state funding for it, and then we got some residents all pitched in and, and uh, you know, sponsored their streets. So that was a good way to do that. It was a collaborative effort where, you know, the town didn't foot all the bill, but they, they footed uh, part of it. Uh, you know, long-term goals, we have, we have some implementations we need to do with this uh, the police report, uh, uh, the consultant that we hired. It's made a lot of good recommendations, so we, we need to implement those. And infrastructure, and that's, when I say that, I, the pipes underneath all these streets, okay. they were put in Thanks, the city, so. Sorry, sorry, oh, it's me. Or is it you? Please. I'll have to answer this question. Yeah. Uh, you're going to be next. So uh, short-term, I want to fix the budget, I want to fix the police department, and I want to fix the revenue problem as well as fill up the businesses that have left. Those are my short term goals. I have a plan for each of those things, and I would start that immediately. 
Uh, long term, I think we have to look at the zoning issues that we have in terms of more and more construction going up around us as well as here and how that affects our own infrastructure. And we have to talk with our state and local officials as well to make sure that we have an infrastructure plan that's going to support the amount of traffic and people that we get through our town. Thank you. That's down to TJ. I think the I just don't ask you. It's a little longer one. Huh? As this town continues to grow more into a year-round place and with expensive new homes being built each year, the need for a more year-round police services, year-round police services are needed. How would you suggest we work within our financial needs to ensure we can have the services needed to protect our town and our property values year-round? That's an important question, and, and for those that are confused, we're slowly becoming more and more of a year-round town every single year. Uh, I met with people earlier today that are, are getting closer to retirement age, and their plan is to come here and be part of the community on a year-round basis. So that affects us in many different ways because they used to rent their properties. So it has other impacts on us as well. Um, funding our police department is critical as well. If we have enough police to manage the 10 to 20,000 people that come every weekend in the summer, I think we'll have enough police to handle the needs of our town in the winter as well. And so that's what's critical, is having professional police officers that are paid full time at, at reasonable salaries, and the commissioners recently fixed that issue so I'm proud of the work we've done there, but we need to do more to make sure we have the right police officers in the right positions and, and make sure that year after year, as we grow into the more year-round town that we're gonna be, that we are less dependent on our part-time agents and more dependent on a full-time professional police department. And we can do that. Yeah, the services that people need in the winter, uh, I'm not exactly sure how many full-time residents we have, because that's really a true question. How many of them are in this house in the winter? Um, but they're full-time nonetheless. I'm sure they have some place warm also, so like Rob. Uh, but so our police, you know, think of it this way. You know, you're policing 20 to 30,000 people on a weekend, give or take, and you need an X number of officers to handle that. And, and there's actually a formula that, that police officers use for that. Now, for four four months, 100 days plus, you know, a little bit of the shoulder season on on uh, on each of those. Well, what do we do those other eight months? And you know, we. We don't want officers sitting around doing nothing, but you know more and more residents here. So we need to increase the uh, the number of full-time officers probably by by a couple. But uh, other than that, uh, that's how we're going to police it. And they're, they're going to have enough time in the winter months to handle it. Okay. Is it my turn for that? It's your turn to answer that question. Oh, yes. Okay. Well, I don't have anything as big as extending or doing that. But uh, can you repeat the question? The question is, as we grow into a more year-round place, talking about the need for police, so how would you suggest we work uh, with our financial uh, needs to ensure we have the service that's needed to protect our town and our property values year-round? Okay, uh, so first of all, we have to staff the police force. They've been understaffed for a long time. They were understaffed from Dale to Mayor before TJ and now under TJ. So, you know, saying that you think it's a good idea for whatever it's been three years and it hasn't happened means you don't think it's that good an idea. I think it's a great idea. And I think to pay for it, you have a number of things that you could do with enforcing the ordinances that exist today that would generate revenue to support a larger police force. Uh, Dewey used to be known as a town you didn't speed through. Now in King Charles, I see cars going 65 and 70 miles an hour on the 25. So there's plenty of things that could be done to enforce the ordinances boost revenue to pay for the police. Thank you. Dr. Dale? First off, if you look at the budget, and I have, our police bring in somewhere from three quarters to almost all of their budget. And it, now, we don't, want, we don't want police out there, we don't want to be telling police, bring in your budget. That's not the way to do it, that's improper. But they do bring in three quarters to almost all of their budget. Secondly, and we're talking about year round, you know, I, I asked a couple of questions because I live here year round, and I found out that at times Dewey only had one police officer on call during the winter. And if that police officer gets called for help in the Rehoboth, 
or the forgotten mile, then we have zero clean talk. Now, I think it's a possibility that in talking to the chief and talking to uh, the town manager, that we should be able to, in the future, when we get that many more people here during the winter, we should have an additional police officer. We have nine now, we should have 10, or we should eventually have 10, but not right away. We need to hire part-timers from other towns that want to work part-time and they're full-fledged police officer at the time. Good job. <laughs> what infrastructure upgrades do you feel are in most immediate need? How can you fund these projects? And is a property tax on your table? Ooh. All right, let's take the property tax off the table because that's the town is formed by not having property tax. So unless something tells us differently, that's never going to happen. So. Uh, the infrastructure needs are unique. Um, so I started saying at the end of my last statement was the pipes underneath the streets were put in in the 60s. So they're 50 years old. And if you notice, they drain very slowly. It's not like they don't work, but there's a lot of things in there. Primary, if I were to guess, there's going to be sand, rocks, some trash, I'm sure, I'm sure is in there as well. Um, but these needs are, are big. I mean, the state, we need the state's help as well. And, you know, I've spoken to Senator Lopez about it. Uh, represent, our House Representative uh, uh, Pete Schwarzkopf and even Governor Carney about it. And I actually took Governor Carney up to Root Avenue, not, uh, that was probably back in December. So I mean, everybody's aware of it and, and we're gonna need others' help on this. So the first thing we did, which I think is, is the best idea, was, was to analyze, we, we authorized our town manager to, to hire an engineering firm to go in and, take, and put cameras down each of these things and find out where the real problems exist. And once we know what that's going to cost, now we can start to talk about how we're going to pay for it. Okay, thanks, Paul. And the question is coming down to Phil. Could I interrupt for a minute? Would you read the question again? Sure. What infrastructure upgrades do you feel are in the most immediate need? How can you fund these projects? And is property tax on your table? That's a good question. Well, property sure. tax isn't on my table, as you've heard. Uh, I think that, like I've said, things like fees and taxes, I would not be in favor of increasing any of those things to pay for infrastructure or anything else until I've had a real budget in front of me. So yeah, I said that and then I said you could raise the fee for the Bayside, but again, I wouldn't do that unless I knew what the budget really looked like. Uh, as far as what I would do, I think that there's a lot going on in the streets with more and more people on bikes, on foot, crossing the streets, not knowing exactly how to cross the streets. The lines on the roads on uh, King Charles and Route 1 sometimes aren't painted all that well. I understand there's a plan to fix that, um, but I'm not an incumbent, so I haven't really looked at the infrastructure plans that exist today, and I'm, I'm not gonna try to come up with some plan that isn't based on what's already underway. So. Thank you. We definitely need, we definitely have big problems with our infrastructure, mainly the drainage system going towards the bay <laughs> and the paving of the street. But you understand there's only four blocks, maybe five, there's only four blocks in Dewey, blocks, not whole streets, that belong to Dewey Beach. The rest of it belongs to the state. They've been very, very helpful to us, but we need to ask. We need to go to them more often. When we wanted our potholes paved over to on the other side of, uh, of uh, Starboard, they, they simply called the state. The state came in within the next week and took care of the pothole. That's, we have to do more of that. We have to go back to the state and push back to them and ask for the money to do that. It used to be we would, they would ask us to take their money and be the contractor to pave the street. We did that for many years and we'll probably need to offer to do that again. Uh, the other thing is I've heard nobody mention sea level rise here. Infrastructure problems are going to multiply drastically with sea level rise, especially since Dewey is a hole. Okay. Uh, well, I, the second question is equally as important as the first question, and that is taxes. And taxes are a question for all of you, not for us. The commissioners will eventually, someday in the future, when we get to 50% uh, year-round residents, need to talk about this more with you. But right now, taxes are not on the table as a real estate tax. 
we do need to think about infrastructure tax. We do need to ask the hotels if perhaps we can phase in uh, accommodation tax over three or six years that helps us gain or uh, increase our revenue. I also have to say I agree with Mr. Rowe a little bit, so we have to enforce our rules better just to make sure that we get the money from that area as well wherever possible. But I will, Dale hit on it lightly, I'm gonna hit on it harder. The partnerships that we've developed over the last two years with our state and our county are invaluable to this town and how we're gonna pay for the infrastructure needs that we have is gonna be continuing those partnerships with the state and the county and making sure that they know how valuable Dewey Beach is to the state of Delaware and the resort industry in general to the entire state. We are the number two employer in the state of Delaware with resort. All right, CJ. I can shut up now. Sorry. I have a moment to fill. You're going to have the next question. This will be the final question before the break. So, guys out there in the audience, get your questions finished up. We'll pick those up after this round. Are you in favor of continuing the effort to more clearly define parking spaces on our streets, including recovering the recovering the town property where encroached? One more time. Are you in favor of continuing the effort to more clearly define parking spaces on our streets, including recovering the town property where encroached? I wasn't aware that that plan was ongoing, but um, I, I think that it's difficult to mark our streets here, uh, particularly I know living on the beach block, it's hard, to, it's hard to tell where sometimes they would even go because the sand blows across the, the road so much. So. Uh, I think an ordinance that requires people to park within, say, four feet of the car in front of them would stop people from parking nine feet from the car in front of them and taking spaces that could be generating revenue for the city. But I also think that anything we do with rules has to be clear, has to be posted, and people have to have access to it because too often people are getting tickets for doing things that they have no idea is wrong. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm very, I'm for continuing to mark the streets where the parking is. I, I am not for just coming in and butchering somebody's garden just because it happens to be over on the town property. And that's happened before. The uh, gentleman behind me years ago, they, they got more, your garden goes into a parking space, we, we need the parking space, so we're gonna, we're gonna cut it back. And, but without counting, we're coming on such and such a day, you want to be there, let's discuss it. They walked in and butchered the hedges that he had planted there. Now that's wrong to do. Technically, it was on the town property. Technically, the town could do it to a bunch of people, but they shouldn't do it that way. They should use some common sense, and that's what's missing sometimes in government, common sense. But uh, I believe three times for the first time this year, and all the times I, I've been to do it almost 20 years, Three times this year, Chesapeake Street had every parking space full. Every single parking space. And that doesn't sound like much, but it's going to happen more and more. Thank you. Thank you, For those that don't know, the parking rules are the, for a 50 by 100 in the town of Dewey Beaches. You can have one 10 foot, you can have two 10 foot, or you can have a 20 foot driveway. The rest of the front of your property needs to remain for public parking. It's the town's property. And there was an, an effort last year to identify driveways throughout the north end of town in particular, but it also went into the center and the south end of town. It, it is difficult because sometimes there's homes that appear to be a single family home that are not a single family home. And, that, and, and there's even places where in the past uh, a plan was approved that had a 50 foot driveway in it. So this is gonna be, need to be a comprehensive plan that identifies the public space and the private space those areas that are public, that is revenue lost. So, for, and quite frankly, 80% of you do it right. It might be 85. The 15 or whatever percent that remain that don't do it right, they're gonna kick and scream all the way. But I think for those that do it right, thank you. We need those parking spaces, and it's a big part of our town's revenue, so thank you. Yeah, I think our town manager, uh, when he first came down here from Dover, he, he looked at that and he, he, he recognized that it needed to be marked better. So I think he made some really good progress this year. And for those of you that you know don't know this, but it's a yellow, it's a very, very like a highlighter, but it has two little edges to it. And 
you know, what one of the suggestions I got from a, a, a resident the other day was, can you fill that in and don't have this and just make it a bold line, like don't cry, they even write no parking line. And you know, it's, a, it's all about communication, but I think if we can market that way, uh, that would help. You know, the, the real solution would be to put curbs in, but we're probably looking at $100,000 a street. Uh, it would be nice to have, and that goes back to the needs and wants. Uh, so in the meantime, paint's cheap, I think we can do it that way. Thank you all. Okay, we're going to take a, a break at this point, and you'll see some of our board members come around collecting uh, cards. Boy, that's we need to do better moving forward is communication. Um, and that affects all parts of government, but especially parking in New York Beach. Um, I think that the question about driveways is a big part of it as well, and making sure that we have a clear understanding of where the driveways are. And Mr. Rowe, he even indicated that sometimes people get tickets and they don't even know why. Our signage is good, but we need to make sure there's more of it and it's clear to read and understand. Um, parking the wrong way on the street, making sure both of your tires are off the street. The worst part, of, I think, of our parking program is people figure it out after they get a ticket. Um, and that's not the best way to move forward. We also have to think about... Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I think I'll end it. <laughs> okay, so one of the main parking problems is the number of parking spaces. So I think by enforcing the, you know, the 10 foot, the two 10 foot driveways or one 20 foot, I mean, that's a big help. And then the signage of it and the the extra paint the market better so people can understand it. But the other part of it is the park mobile system we have. Uh, so uh, last year we went to, instead of pay by space, we went to the pay by plate. Uh, pay by space was a little confusing for people as well because you went in and that's space number 17, A17. Uh, but sometimes sand is over top of that space. And sometimes you got it wrong. And you know, the last thing you want to do is annoy your customers. People are coming down here and spending their money and, and enjoying themselves. Uh, so this pay by play is a better way to do it, but Delaware has a unique uh, setup. You have a PC that's up and down, it's a, uh, a vertical PC and then a number. And sometimes people forget to do that. Uh, so what our, uh, our our judge, our alderman, uh, has done is you know waive uh, part of the ticket because if you keep forgiving it, you know, things don't you know, don't change. So you know we're trying to do the best and be friendly. Thank you. Come on, Phil. I find myself agreeing with Mr. Bauer that a big problem with parking is the number of parking spaces. Um, that, however, is something that we probably should look at a city planner to take a look at our layout and figure out what the best thing to do is. I don't know that any of us are experts on figuring out how to park more cars in a small area, but I'm sure there's somebody that does that for a living. Uh, one idea that I had was that if we could find a place to our west that was, you know, within a certain driving distance and able to park a lot of cars and we could have a shuttle bus that ran back and forth to the beach, we might be able to alleviate the on-street parking by you know, putting 150 or 200 spots off time, off the grid. Right TJ, first will come to you. The town has spent $500,000 on independent consultants and not done much to account. Recently, the police consultant report was bad. It's been three months and no accountability. What would you do to change this? Hmm. Interesting question. Um, a half a million dollars in consulting fees that were spent. Uh, part of that talks about the Max Walton report. And what a lot of people don't know is that our insurance company suggested that we not do it the way we did it as a town, and that we use our insurance company to do it. And that would have cost us about $100,000, and then they would have picked up the tab beyond that. So the town decided, long before I came along, to uh, go independent and let our attorney um, hire an independent attorney to do an investigation. That investigation also gave us recommendations, which we didn't pay for, or we didn't ask for. So that whole report that came out of the Max Walton report is a big part of the half a million dollars in that question. The 25,000 I think we spent on our Dr. Warren report, um, uh, we are working on those things, and we're gonna take steps in the coming year to make sure that our police department is the best police department we can be, so thank you. 
Yeah, so two years ago, that was, that was one of the problems we had. And, and you know, you learn, uh, you know, I didn't know anything about the, uh, the Warren report back then. Other, I couldn't understand why, when you had an HR problem, why didn't you hire an HR specialist? The decision was made by a previous administration here to hire a lawyer. Lawyers are very expensive. And if there are any lawyers in the house, I'm not saying anything bad about you, but you know, it just costs a lot of money. And you know, as we learned here now, the town spent a half a million dollars and this actually makes me sick. That, you know, could have got it done for a hundred thousand. So, but that, that's a path we've done and, and just to refresh on where we were two years ago. So now we've hired a consultant and he, there's a whole list, a laundry list of things that we can improve on. Uh, and you have to do them one by one. And, and right now, you know, our, our last meeting we sat in, we said, hey, how do we prioritize this? And what we want to do is we kick this back now to the police chief and the officers and say, hey, prioritize this. So I don't know how to do police work. I'm going to go back to someone and say, hey, what would your priority be to get these implemented? So one of the biggest problems in the Warren report was the police chief. So kicking it back down to him to fix seems like an odd way to go to me. Um, you know, we don't have to take them one at a time. We have to get it done. The police department is a shambles and an embarrassment to Dewey Beach. So if there's 50 recommendations and we take them one at a time, how long do you think this group is going to take to get to five? Six. It's going to be a really long time. Yeah. Well, we can blame it on past administrations, and I'm one of them. We can blame it on failure to act, and I'm one of them. You know, but you know what? It's the failure to move forward. I think to say we can blame it on the police chief and the police departments in shambles is grossly inappropriate. It's, it, it comes from not knowing what's going on yourself. It comes from not knowing what the proper procedure is and what the law is in Delaware. You know, police chief has the police chief feel right. You can't just jump in and tell somebody you're doing a horrible job, and you shouldn't anyway. You have to actually have an investigation. You have to have a number of things. You know how government works. I agree. That we haven't done it part of our job. Ten seconds left. I just think people that don't know should find out first before they say what should be done. I read the report. The next question goes to Paul. Current financials show a deficit of hundreds of thousands of dollars, and little dedicated revenue will be coming in after October 2019. What steps should be taken to resolve and avoid this deficit in the future? All right, so yesterday's budget and finance meeting, uh, they, they this chairs, uh, you know, we got the monthly numbers back in. And right now we're gonna run at uh, revenue about uh, $3.52 million budget, and we're coming in at about 3.48. One of the things to look at, one of our biggest sources of revenue is a transfer tax. And most people don't sell their houses in midsummer. That's a September, October, November. Try to close by the end of the year, right? And as your as your as your realtor's going to tell you, your attorney's going to say you're going to close on you know the next to the last day of the month. So so you don't have to pay that whole thing. So we're hitting that that biggest cycle of where we're getting the revenue in. Uh, historically, we bring in uh, you know about 50 houses a year. So you know. It, Hopefully we end up at 50, we end up at 47, or so we're gonna be a little short there, but that, when that's one of your biggest drivers, uh, you know, you have to make sure that everything's gonna happen. Now inventory's coming up. Uh, there's a lot of new condos being built over here at the high, so hopefully they, they kick in. Right. We're just gonna question for you. Yeah. One more time. Current financials show a deficit of hundreds of thousands of dollars and little dedicated revenue will be coming in after 2019, October 2019. What steps should be taken to resolve and avoid this deficit in the future? So, so at the last commissioner's meeting, uh, TJ asked the town manager an excellent question, which was we're a hundred and something thousand dollars behind. There's also some uh, un uncommitted, uh, I'm sorry, some committed expenses that will have to be added onto that. 
what is your strategy? And he said, well, I hope, operative word hope, the transfer taxes will cover the deficit. Let me tell you, when you're budgeting, hope is not a strategy. <laughs> Question. Current financials show a deficit of hundreds of thousands of dollars, and little dedicated revenue will be coming in after October 2019. What steps should be taken to resolve and avoid this deficit in the future? In the future, now, you know, what steps are we taking? Uh, I don't think you're going to find out that we were we were uh, hundreds of thousand dollars behind last year. I think you're going to find that this year we're going to probably come in just under our budget. And I think the right commissioners, and I take responsibility for this, the commissioners have not done their due diligence. We need to sit down with the, the budget and finance committee, the town manager, the police chief, all the department heads and the commissioners and have a workshop to say, okay, here's the situation, what are you gonna do now? And so if you don't do something, we're going to change it, and you're going to, your, your departments aren't going to get what you think you should get. And unless we communicate better, unless the commissioner stops the spending button, we're going to have a problem. Okay. I think Mr. Dale hit it head on and um, told the truth. The, uh, uh, we, we have been spending in efforts to try to make commissioners happy and get things done. Um, in areas that we probably shouldn't have over the last few months, and uh, we need to take a look at that. But the question is flawed. It's not hundreds of thousands of dollars, not by a um, long shot. Um, and it, the, our revenue doesn't turn off in October, but October is a good measuring stick. The, as Commissioner Bauer pointed out, there are many condos at the Hyatt that should be ready to close soon. Um, as that building finishes, those buildings are gonna close in the million dollar range. So I believe, Dale, I think you're close, but I think we're gonna beat our budgets this year. And uh, Mr. Brown, this is part of the process that we have to go through. The way this town is run without a tax, it's very important that we do do everything we can to uh, have transfer tax, accommodation tax, and all of those things, and they're variable. In 2007, we had some real issues because accommodations tax didn't come in. We have to do our very best to make this a great town for people to buy and sell and rent and keep those dollars coming in. Okay. I think we have time for two more questions. So this one will go to you. Phil. What is being done to reduce or eliminate the number of lawsuits filed against the town? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's three questions. <laughs> town manager at our direction consistently talks to the department heads, especially the police, about lawsuits. We've noticed that the lawsuits against the police have gone down, and therefore our insurance rating has gone up. I think you can, I think we're all very careful about what's being said in public so that we don't have lawsuits, either internal or external lawsuits. How do we prevent litigation? Um, there has to be strategies to prevent litigation. We have to have better training throughout our town to make sure that our employees don't inadvertently or obviously do things that would cause litigation. So there's a component. As commissioners, we need to be really smart when we talk in public and make sure we don't say things that could get us into litigation. And, and I can't say enough about uh, the strategies that must be in place that we have to do things. Sometimes we have to, uh, when it comes to human resources things, with those things must be done in an executive session so we don't put ourselves into potential litigation. Uh, so this is a tricky wicket, and being a good town, being good stewards, will help us to avoid litigation wherever possible. Yeah, a lot of times, you, it's a litigious society we live in, so you know, people sue you for a lot of different reasons. Uh, but some of, the, some of the problems we brought upon ourselves uh, you know, you know, probably read in the paper. I mean, some employees were publicly humiliated. I mean, you're going to get sued when it happens. That doesn't. That's not a good idea in any business. Uh, no one wants to open the newspaper the following morning and see your name in it with your, one of your bosses calling out. My boss did it to me. I'd, I'd be suing as well. 
So we have to be careful what we say and how we say it. Personnel matters need to be handled in an executive session. And if there are issues with employees, that's between a boss and the employee, and that's, you know, or else no one would ever work for any government agency. You know, how, who, would, who would do that? You want, what would you do with your performance review? Oh, I'm going to put it in the newspaper tomorrow. No, that's a bad idea. So, you know, we have to be smart about it ourselves. All right, Dale. Oh, no. <laughs> Take the last one. We, along with all coastal towns, have a significant risk due to the rising sea level oh, issues. Yes. What is or can be done to address this issue, which will impact all of us? All right, we've already started. I, I mentioned the last time I cut off and my mouth a little too much. Do we escape like a shallow bowl with reef trees being the, the, the deepest end of the bowl? And we're cooperating with the Center for Inland Bay, the state and the federal government, and putting up matching funds so that we can start with Reef Street, with the CID and the project that's going in now, Center for Inland Bay, the project that's going in now, and hopefully work our way out. This is a, for all of us, not only a test project, but a project we think is going to work to help Reef Street, Reef Avenue, excuse me, and then work our way out. The, the survey said that uh, the, the drainage survey in town, the water, I'm sorry, I'm missing my point said that uh, it would take about a million dollars per street to handle the drainage and the flooding. You know, if somebody's got 22 million, I'm more than happy to move right ahead on it, but we are working on it. I'm sorry, I'm just one time. We, along with all coastal towns, have a significant risk due to the rising sea level issues. What is or can be done to address this issue, which will impact all of this. Understood. Um, I first have to a shout out to Mr. Tyler who and, and Mayor Hansen um, who have been working on this long before all of us. Um, the, the Center for Bay's project that's going on on Reed Avenue, Diane Hansen helped start that and, and we just helped make sure it got done and it's taken two years now and, and she's been out of office for two years so and it's finally going to get done now. Um, building a more resilient community, being part of ACT, the Association of Coastal Towns. Anybody know the seven towns? South Bethany, Bethany, Fenwick Island, Dewey Beach, Rehoboth, and Open Acres, and Lewis. Those are the seven towns that we partner with currently in ACT that was dissolved back in the previous year, 2006, that is now a vibrant part lobbying group that is going to help us try to do everything we can to be ready for sea rise. Sea rise is going to be a complicated issue that we're going to need federal, state, and all our partners together, and each one of you, to think of ways that you can deal with stormwater on your own properties. And we'll do what we can as a town as well. Now, I've mentioned before, I mean, the, these are going to be expensive fixes, so we're going to need, you know, need mom and dad at the state level to, uh, to help us out here a little bit. How you doing, Eric? <laughs> no, but you know, all kidding aside, though, I mean, this this Reed Avenue project is getting started. What is it next week, I believe? Mm -hmm. So um, that's going to divert some water. And you know, I'm not an engineer, so I'm not the right guy to try to engineer a, a solution here. But yeah, so we have to rely on people that know much more than we do. All I do know is that you know, either you make water lower or your street higher, and those one of two things are going to happen. Water's going to find the lowest level. So. Um, you know, if we make the streets higher, then we flood the, the houses. If the houses build up higher than the street, then the water's going to go in the street. So, it's, it, you know, we, we have to we have to have a long range plan to do this. And I think fixing the the, the drainage first, uh, putting the cameras down there that I mentioned earlier. Let's find out what we really have, and let's start putting a dollar to it, and then we can start talking about how to repay for it. But at this point, we don't know exactly what it costs until we have an engineer. Perfect. Good to you. I'm no expert in sea level mitigation, I don't have to say that. And I am an expert in organizational management and performance. And I think that as a leader, I would look to find every solution possible and then see what we can afford to do. I think we have to make plans to spend a significant amount of money on this in the future. And there's going to have to be, again, a collective effort to get our finances straight and to start generating more revenue than we are now. So, uh, you know, exactly how that's going to work in terms of 
what those solutions will be, I wouldn't know until we were able to solicit some real solutions from outside. All right. Thank you guys so much. I you up here. I you up here for 90 minutes. Yeah. We've got it now. Uh, again, I want to thank Ernie. I didn't thank him earlier. Senator Lopez taking the time out of the schedule to come and listen to our issues here in Dewey Beach. Uh, a reminder again, if anybody wants to be a part of the Dewey Beach Civic League, you've got your forms on the table. Talk to any of the board members here in the room. And please stay. We've got some sandwiches and drinks and a little conversation afterwards with the, the candidates. Mm -hmm. Closing oh. statements, yes. <laughs> you do get those, don't you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, closing statements will begin with TJ. Okay. Uh, next on the list. Okay. Paul Bauer. Back in June, back in June, when fights and public safety were a concern, we needed to take action. And he helped me get in front of the right people to keep our town and our people safe. On election day 2017, Roberta and Judy sat on the dune asking for support for dune mats. This didn't come out of nowhere. The people of Dune Beach wanted dune mats. Paul, as we sat there waiting for the voters to come in, Paul and I sat and talked about it, and he helped me understand how we could make that happen. And we did. Dale Cook, after the 2017 election, when time came for change, you, stalled, you stood tall and proud, and you walked with us, not against us, and you never divided us. And although we did not always agree, uh, you're the senior statesman, this is coming out in this whole thing, whether anybody likes it or not. Um, you were the senior statesman, and that wisdom and history uh, was needed. You always helped guide us uh, to live within our means. Me, thanks to our Mayor's Corner newsletter, newspaper articles, and TV appearances, I've become one of the biggest cheerleaders of our town. I think that anybody has ever seen. And I, I, I also asked people that didn't like me and didn't support me to sit on committees and continue their mission to help clean up the mess that was there before us. In town government, there are five people, five votes on a commission. You need three votes to pass anything. Commissioner Rowe has asked us to vote for one person. I think we need to vote for three, and I'm gonna ask you to vote for Paul Bauer, Dale Cook, and then at the last minute, vote for me so that we can keep things moving forward. Which way? I don't know. Okay. Okay. Yeah, thanks, DJ. The, uh, you know, it's funny that because Doom ads weren't one of the things we were running on. That wasn't part of our platform. No. Uh, but as I was talking to Senator Lopez uh, at, at the break here. There's a, a thing called community transport uh, transportation funds, and uh, I was just informed that we're going to be able to get a nice grant to make those Doom ads longer. So I'm going to be uh, passing around a collection basket to see if we can get some uh, individual sponsors on some streets. So if you can help us participate, it's uh, we're all this together. Uh, but uh, I think I believe in a lot of the same things uh, everybody does here. You know, property values have to go up, right? I think we're doing a good job of that. The rental market has to stay strong. I think we're doing a good job of that. Uh, we've got to promote doing these positive. Uh, you know, so you know, I can promise you some, you know, uh, some things here. Is, you know, balancing this budget. Uh, I went to the budget and finance meeting last night, and many other people did. You know, hey, we have an unreliable revenue stream in some places, and it's going to go up and down. And depending on what day it is, you know, it could be up and it could be down, but we just have to ride through it. I think Dave Davis does an excellent job. But there's a lot of teamwork in this town that, that makes this whole thing work. So uh, I, I concur with TJ here. If you could vote for the three incumbents, that would be awesome. I'm here today to seek your help in making Dewey Beach a shining example of a well-managed, well-organized resort community. Together, we have that chance. I'm here to ask for your support and, indeed, your vote. But more than that, as I try to win a seat from these incumbents, I'm asking you to use one and only one of your three votes. I'm fighting the bad math of being the only one from Dewey Beach to step up for what needs to be done, and if my voters don't cancel out their votes for me by offering their votes, to the incumbents, we can win and immediately put our town on a better footing going forward. I'm not here to promise miracles. We must be, all be aware that to get out of this hole, we must stop digging. 
If we can do that more than anyone else running, I believe I can restore your faith in your government and address the issues you've heard about for three long years. Thanks for your time and your kind attention. I appreciate all of y'all coming here tonight. You just turned me all on not stubborn. I was born and raised in Washington, D.C. Uh, I've been commissioner, I've been the mayor. I've taken over the duties of the town manager when we needed to hire a town manager. You know, I, I have the knowledge and the experience to help run the town. I would want to help. I've spent more time, effort, energy, and more committee and more meetings than probably the vast majority of people up here. Uh, and I tell you that TJ's been around here a lot longer than I have. I think he was born close to here anyway. But I would like your vote. I need your vote. And I would hope you would vote. And I would hope you don't waste your vote. I would like to have one of the three votes. And I would like you to vote the other two votes. Don't waste them. Don't throw them away. I think it's a mistake. I think if you want to help this town, join a committee. Come to committee meetings. Know about what you're talking and know about what you want for this town. That way you can speak intelligently and you can, when you make claims, you can absolutely back up your claim. And I thank you all for taking the time to come here tonight and be willing to volunteer for your community. Woo -woo.